Okay, so this is the um, slides for week nine. We're going to talk about memory architecture. We're going to talk about the role of memory, um, memory organization for programs, and also memory hierarchy. So in embedded systems, um, there are um, you know many memory components. Um, you know, beyond memory component, there are storage, uh, communications. Um, we need to communicate with sensors and actuators. Uh, we need to do um, computing, um, but it's with more constrained resource than general purpose computing. Uh, we have um, to have the system in a small form factor, consume uh, very little amount of power, uh, low power consumption, and very reliable. Um, we 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 um, we use memory for all kinds of um, stages uh, or parts of design for storing instructions, uh, for storing data, um, sensor data, uh, input data, and also for um, storing data that will be used to controlled actuators and for signal processing or any processing task for the computation, we need memory to store uh, intermediate variables. Um, so memory is uh, very important in the uh, embedded system. We will consider many different things as part of the memory architecture. We will consider the types of memory. Uh, is it going to be volatile or non-volatile? Uh, and for volatile uh, memory, uh, is it going to be SRAM or DRAM? Uh, both have pros and cons. Uh, for SRAM, uh, it's uh, faster uh, than DRAM, uh, but SRAM it tends to be costly. So that's why uh, we tend to have smaller uh, size um, of SRAM than DRAM and DRAM could be um, abundant in, in with large quantity um, because it's cheap. Um, we also have issues about memory maps. Hardware architecture is the ones that used very often by embedded microcontrollers and memory map IO. Um, like the memory map we showed earlier. Some of the registers can be mapped to both. Um, the I.O. registers can be mapped in memory address space and you can access them uh, either way. Also, we consider memory organization. Um, some variables or data are statically allocated. Some are allocated in stacks. Uh, some are allocated in heaps. And also uh, related to that, there's different memory model of uh, C programming and um, and also internally how we organize this memory and caches and virtual memory, etc. Um, and then in the um, protect environment, we also consider the memory segmentation uh, to isolate uh, processes. All right. So for non volatile memory, um, essentially preserves contents when the power is off. Uh, you have been using it a lot. Uh, the USB thumb drives, those are type of non-volatile memory. Um, there are even more um, finer categories, EEPROM and double EEPROM. Those are the programmable read-only memory used in computer motherboards and many other places. Uh, you basically program once and that information will stay there. That's very useful for um, things like bootloaders, BIOS. Um, and for flash memory, uh, you can um, read and write. You can erase a block at a time. Uh, it can endure a large number of erase cycles. 
um, and the controller can be quite complex. And then for these drives are um, also possible, but it's not well suited for embedded systems due to the power consumption form factors. So flash memory are the, wide, the wide, most widely used type of memory in embed world if you want to store information for longer term. And uh, if you do want frequent read write, then you're going to be looking at different types of the memory. And that's the volatile memory. Volatile memory, you can read and write at the runtime uh, as you need, but they will lose contents when power is off. In this category, there are SRAM, DRAM, um, also um, for SRAMs, you know, for, you can, it stands for static random access memory. It's very fast among all these different types, um, but it's more power hungry. And they are used only for small um, storage units like caches, scratch pad, um, things like that. DRAM uh, is more popular because it's uh, cost effective. Uh, it's slower than SRAM, but you can uh, pack a lot more bytes in, in a, a single chip than uh, SRAM. It requires some periodic refresh, typically used for main memory. For bootloaders, they will transfer data from uh, non-volatile memory to volatile memory, and then the system can go on from that point. Uh, so we, like, like, normally, you, if a desktop or laptop, we power it up. Uh, sometimes on the vendors uh, manufacturer logo flash, and then you can see a few quick uh, messages uh, pop up uh, before your OS loads, and that's the bootloader, uh, which basically loads the um, um, the OS from a non-volatile storage space and then put them to volatile memory like DRAM. And then the system can go on from that point and running on these volatile memory. Here's an example of the chip uh, with um, ARM core and one megabytes of flash memory. So memory maps are very typical for all different uh, embedded systems. We saw the example of AVR a microcontroller earlier. Um, this is a example. So don't take the numbers literally. In this example, uh, we have a few segments in this big memory space. So if you count from zero all the way to uh, eight Fs, that's actually four gigabytes. And it's segmented to program memory, data memory, peripherals, uh, data memory DRAM, external devices, and so on. Um, it's easy to mistaken that you have all these, or you have to have all these um, resources. Uh, this memory map is just to say that if you want to have some data memory, like DRAM, to be used by, by the microcontroller or microprocessor, they should reside in this memory region. Doesn't mean that you have to have the full uh, segment um, you know, allocated to the physical memory. You don't have to have that big of DRAM chip. Um, but if you do have um, DRAM space, you should allocate them in this um, place. So that would determine how you do the uh, memory decoders, address decoders to make sure that when the microprocessor access this address, it will be able to access the data in the DRAM chip. Uh, some history about AVR, uh, which is an 8 bit single chip microcontroller. Um, it was developed by two students uh, from Norway and um, it you know, carries a lot of success. Um, it has a modified hardware architecture, uh, that means using separate memory space for program and data. 
Arduino is the um, pro open source hardware boards that use AVR processors from the beginning. Uh, it has a lot of variations um, on, since that point. And there's good you know, people in the open source hardware um, domain. Um, you know, this founder of Arduino and also uh, the founder of Adafruit, uh, which is a very good uh, company that designs and builds and sells um, maker you know, gadgets, electronics. Another example using AVR processor, uh, that's the uh, controller board for the iRobot, um, you know, uh, the um, automatic uh, cleaner um, machine to clean the floors. Um, okay, this is another uh, AtMega chip using AVR architecture. Um, this is an 8-bit microcontroller with 16-bit address. Um, so there are several things that we want to point out here. This is the ALU, which stands for the, the CPU. And we have general purpose registers. We have 32 of them. Each of them is 8-bit. And we have um, 8-bit data bus that connects to all these different components. Uh, so it connects the, the um, uh, ALU with the memory, um, the data memory, also the um, WWE prom um, and program counter. And that connects to the program memory, uh, which is based on flash. And the instructions will be read from that program memory and decoded and then you know, sent to the control uh, so that the ALU can perform certain actions. This is an 8 bit microcontroller with a 16 bit address. 8 bit because uh, the data bus is 8 bit, and also the data width of the registers for the CPU to do computation, they are all 8 bit wide. Uh, 16 bit address uh, because, as you can see, uh, the addresses to these memory locations, uh, they are 16 bit wide. So have four hexadecimal digits, starting from zero to you know, zero four FF, uh, depends on the different um, processors that you actually use. So the question why is called eight bit microcontroller uh, is mainly because the ALU takes eight bit values from the general purpose registers and all the general purpose registers are eight bit wide, and also the computation the data bus is um, uh, is eight bit. Flash memory uh, is for storing instructions. Uh, so when you program, uh, the instructions generated by the compiler will be put into flash memory. And they will stay there um, you know, until you program it again. So it will stay there when you power off. Um, this data SRAM is where you store uh, the you know, general purpose data um, that you can use to to use it to store any temporal um, variables that you use in your computation, in your program. Additional I.O. on the command module. So you have the timer, interrupt, um, and the PWM channels, ADC, and, and so on. All right, so that was about some terminologies in terms of memory types. In the next few slides, I want to talk about memory organization for programs. Specifically, we're going to look at uh, the different ways to allocate memory and use memory. One is statically uh, allocated, uh, that's the compiler. Choose the address at which to store a variable uh, for stack. Uh, is dynamic allocated memory uh, with lasting first out strategy. Uh, heap is dynamically allocated, uh, mainly for the system um, applications. First example, statically allocated memory in C. So we have a few lines of code. 
uh, we have a main program and that's int main um, no input arguments and before that main function I declare variable x which is type of character so that's a bit and in the main program I assign 20 to x I mean 20 in hexadecimal So what we see in this example is that we have one variable that's x and it's declared outside of the function and in fact, outside the main function. And it's a um, so-called global variable in the you know, C programming. And this case, the compiler will choose what address for use to use for x. And because it's declared outside the functions, so this variable is accessible across all the functions, all the procedures. This variable's lifetime is the total duration of the program execution. So that's what we call statically allocated memory uh, in C. We can also statically allocate a variable, a memory space for a variable with limited scope. In this example, we have a function full and inside a function, I declare a variable X again, and it's character type. And, but before that, I have a keyword called static. So this static will make sure that this variable, even though it's declared inside a function, it will be allocated uh, in a statically allocated memory so that it will train its value uh, even the, even after this uh, function ends or we, we get out of the function. So the compiler would choose what address to use to store this value, but this variable is meant to be accessible uh, only in full. The purpose of the static is to uh, make sure that the lifetime is the total duration of the program. So that when you call this function the next time, this X will retain its value. Now, if we don't have a static uh, declaration before the type, so we have our character and uh, type uh, variable X. In this case, this variable will be a automatic variable. And this variable will be allocated on the stack. So the stack is where um, the procedure or the function maintain. It's a, uh, a space that will be allocated when you enter this function and a space will be deallocated uh, when you finish this function. So we'll exit from here. When the procedure is called, this variable is assigned an address on the stack uh, by using the stack pointer. So somewhere here, you, you maintain a stack pointer. Uh, this variable will uh, you know, take one space, one byte here, and then you will be able to use that space uh, to store the value of this variable during the up, uh, execution of this function. This variable persists only for the duration of the call. So when you exit this function, this stack, um, you know, segment, a few um, words or, or a few bytes uh, will be deallocated and this value of the, this X will, will be gone. The stack is somewhere here. Um, as you call the procedure, uh, if it is nested, that means you, you call the same procedure again within the procedure or within the function uh, the stack pointer will move to a lower uh, address space. And when the procedure returns, the pointer will move up. So you can call functions, um, you know, out one after another. You can call a function which can call another function and so on. So that's how the stack uh, grows and shrinks uh, when the um, functions uh, exit one by one. 
So in the next few slides, I have a few questions and I would like you to think uh, to answer the questions related to uh, the memory allocation for these variables. The first question is based on the program here. We have um, character X, that's how we declare this variable. And also we have a function full and inside the function we assign 20 to X. So with this program, and this is the way we declare variable X, what will the compiler do? What, what will, how will we um, allocate memory space for this variable? Um, you know, what is the implications of this? Specifically, what is the um, data width of this variable? Is it a, a byte or a word or, or two bytes or um, some other size? And the other question um, one is one byte. And the other question specifically, where this uh, variable gonna be stored? It's gonna be in static allocated space uh, or it's gonna be in a stack, which is part of the, um, Managed by the function, by the person. Uh, it should be statically allocated space. That's correct. Because we declared this variable outside the function or procedure. So this will be a a bit quantity uh, that's in the statically allocated space mm -hmm. in internal memory. And of course the exact location will be de determined by the compiler uh, because chances are there are more than one variables in that space. So the compiler will arrange them, you know, one by one. The second question, um, we have a slightly different program here. Um, we have the same full function and the way we use X is the same. However, when we declare this variable, we declare it as a character with this heuristic and X. So same questions, uh, what is the size of this variable gonna be? Uh, where is it gonna be stored? Uh, is it gonna be statically allocated space or is it gonna be on the stack? So first of all, what is the size of this variable? Is it one byte or two bytes or three bytes or four bytes? Still one byte. Okay, where is it gonna be allocated? It's gonna be allocated at address zero X20. Okay, so this is a um, more, much trickier question than the first one. So we kind of agree that this is gonna be, again, in a statically allocated space, but we disagree on the data size and also we probably disagree on the, on the value of it. Um, so first line here, character, heuristic uh, and X, in the C context, in the C uh, programs, this is where we declare X as the address that points to a variable of type character. So X itself is an address. And with this address, we can find a value that's of type character, that's a byte. And because in this um, processor, the memory space, if you look at this memory, uh, data memory map, the addresses are all 16 bit. So the possible value of X is actually 16 bit. That is to say, if we want X to be an address, which we say that here, X is an address, 
then X itself should be 16 bit. Does it make sense? Do you follow? Yes, that makes sense. So this is different from uh, the previous question or example. Uh, here, X itself uh, is a 16 bit quantity because it represents an address. And in our case, this processor, the address uh, is a 16 bit value. So X itself is a 16 bit quantity and this variable x is stored at an address in a statically allocated memory in the internal RAM determined by the compiler. So this variable is somewhere here, but this variable is a 16 bit value. And when we go into this function, you assign 20 to x, and that is to say, oh, this address now assign it to 20. Um, so we'll later can use this address to find the uh, corresponding value at that, that memory location 20. And that's likely to be here. But X itself is a 16 bit variable that's allocated in this uh, memory region by the compiler. Okay, question number three, uh, we are adding one more variable um, why? Um, so, you know, for X, it's the same. Uh, what about Y? What's the, um, is Y a, a, you know, 8-bit value or 16-bit? Uh, and where is Y going to be allocated? Uh, so Y will be eight bits. Correct. And uh... and Y will be also in the um, statically allocated space as oh. uh, X. Okay, one more question. Um, so we have a full function and inside the function we have um, character heuristic x comma y. And outside the function we have character z. Um, so where are x, y, z in memory? Do we have Two options, whether are they in statically allocated memory or are they in stack? X and Y are, are in static, uh, X and Y are in um, uh, on the stack and Z is in statically allocated memory. Yep, I would agree with that. And again, uh, X occupies two bytes, y, y and Z occupy one byte each, and X, Y are in, on the stack, and Z are in the statically allocated memory. Oh, there's one more. Okay, so. What is this? What are we doing here? So I have two variables um, because they are declared inside the function. So both of them are gonna be on the stack. Uh, so they will, you know, they will be allocated uh, when you enter this function and they will disappear when you exit from the function. Uh, again, X is going to be a 16-bit value because of its uh, address. And Y is a 8-bit um, value on the stack. And uh, this line here is to 
get the address of y and assign that to x. This is the ampersand sign is four. And this x is to assign 20 to that location. So do you know what the value of y is gonna be after this line? A zero x 20. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, because x points to exactly y. So when we assign a new value using x as the address, we essentially assign zero x 20 um, to variable y. Okay, uh, we have one more. What goes into Z in the following program? Okay, so Z is the return value of this full function. So we have in this function, we declare Y, which is one byte, and we declare X, which is you know, two bytes. And we put X to 20, uh, hex decimal to X. And we will use that address to get the value of it. So we're actually reading something from that location and put that return value put the value that you read from the address 20 to y and then return y. Right, so that's what we do exactly. So uh, we're gonna load the value from IO register at location 20 and put the value into z. Okay, uh, I will skip this one. Oh, what happened? Um, there's also um, some tricky things about um, recursion. Um, you can call the function, the same function itself uh, within the function. Uh, of course, you need to set a end condition um, you can try this interesting example. Also for dynamically allocated memory, uh, we have heap. Um, so heap is what the OS manages. Um, it, it's, um, it's a way for um, using the memory more efficiently or uh, under programmer's control. Um, when you have calls like malloc and free, uh, those are um, for programmers to allocate a certain amount of space, uh, not just for one variable, but for a continuous segment of the um, memory, use that for no, some. Just to let you know that I was on my way home um, and everything, okay? Okay. Um, for, Mm -hmm. Someone so please milk. Um, sorry, but I'll make sure I take it out as soon as I get to the house for tomorrow, okay? Okay. Um, right. Can you please milk yourself? Um, okay, so with this mat manlock and free, uh, you have the flexibility of using uh, memory more freely especially for a big chunk. But if you don't do it carefully, you may lead to memory leak problems. For example, you, you do malloc, memory allocation for one kilobytes and do that for 1000 times. And that means you're allocating one megabytes of space. After you use it, um, you can call free and you should call free to 
release those allocated space. But if you miss that, then uh, you basically take control of this one megabytes forever until your program dies. Um, if you do that very frequently, you're gonna be accumulating these um, unused memory, but allocated, but unused, never freed. Uh, eventually you're gonna use up all the um, physical memory in your system. Also may cause memory fragmentation uh, that will um, prevent you from allocating larger space if you don't free uh, enough space uh, that you requested earlier. There's techniques about um, how you manage this more efficiently, automatic garbage collection, uh, it can require stopping everything and reorganizing, uh, but that's um, not really uh, very useful in the embedded domain, especially for real-time programs. Okay. Um, so we have a few slides left from last week regarding memory architecture. So we're gonna cover those first. Uh, we talked about um, memory architecture, um, the, how the microcontrollers organize memory spaces and how do we locate uh, the uh, ports and the data in the memory, et cetera. Um, here, we're gonna look at memory hierarchies. Memory hierarchies refer to the fact that you have a few different um, types of memory uh, in a embedded system. Typically you have um, register files, um, sometimes called scratch pads. Um, in addition to those, you have caches. Um, that's more common in higher end microprocessors, embedded microprocessors. Um, caches uh, is a subset of memory space that's mapped to SRAM. So because it's based on SRAM, its access speed is fast, but the size of the cache is relatively small. If you access any item uh, that's stored uh, in this SRAM using an address, you may or may not find that data item in this space, so-called cache. If you are using an address trying to find data, but that data is not in the cache, that's called a cache miss. A miss is handled by copying contents from the larger DRAM to SRAM. Um, Scratchpad is a little bit different from cache, even though uh, both Scratchpad and cache are based on SRAM. Scratchpad is uh, using a separate address space from the DRAM. In contrast, SRAM, sorry, cache um, shares the same address space, even though cache is much smaller than DRAM. Um, so that's a major difference between the cache and Scratchpad. And for cache, uh, you don't really have to manage uh, it's built in the microprocessor chip. Um, it's addressing, it's uh, invalidation or copying data from DRAM to cache if it is not there. All these are done by the microprocessor hardware, the chip itself. Whereas for Scratchpad, it's essentially a small but fast memory space that your software can use. So your software manages what is stored there. Segmentation is a way to maintain uh, multiple regions uh, out of the same physical space for different purposes. And oftentimes you use segmentation uh, to um, you know, organize data for instruction, um, sorry, uh, organize um, information such as instructions uh, or data. And you may have segments for different um, tasks or processes. And you will need to use permissions uh, and also the rules to regulate which task can access which memory. All right, this is an example where we have cache uh, in addition to the main memory. 
what we have here is a CPU that's gonna uh, do computation on data. The CPU will be doing computation on data that is stored in the registers and registers or register file is on the same chip as the um, computing unit. And it's part of the CPU. Um, you can um, access these data and you know, uh, very quickly. Uh, so the instructions will be able to access them to the computation and store the results back to them. But you know, because registers are um, limited in the processor, so you have to use a larger memory space, um, uh, cache, and then DRAM. Um, now this diagram doesn't really show that well uh, where the cache is actually part of the CPU. Um, that's the reason that we say uh, cache is managed by the CPU hardware and you just really don't have to um, um, worry, you know, how do you manage the data in the cache. And this, this part, um, if it is a scratch pad, then uh, it may or may not be on the chip, but most, you know, mo mo more cases will be also on the chip on the microprocessor. Um, if you go further from the CPU, you will see um, you use uh, a larger memory component based on DRAM. Uh, DRAM has a higher density, uh, but um, you know, it has to rely on um, refresh to keep the information uh, alive or uh, retain the information. And cache is part of the um, DRAM address space. So when you access data, you supply address to from the processor to these memory components. If they, uh, the address you're trying to uh, access, the cache has a copy already, then you can get the copy and fetch the data directly and then do the computation next. If you cannot find the data in a cache using the address, then the processor needs to go further to access the main memory, where for sure you should find the data you, that you want to access. Even further away, that's the secondary storage based on um, magnetic disk or um, non-volatile flash, uh, where you can store a larger amount of information for a longer time, even after the system is time um, powered off. Um, this diagram shows a little bit differently uh, where your SRAM based scratch pad has a separate memory address space. So you need to have uh, specifically different addresses uh, to access the data in a scratch pad. Uh, for data in the main memory, you need to use another uh, separate um, different address. Um, so you will, uh, these components will own it uh, has its own segment of address space. Um, in these situations, you have to really uh, design your software well so you can take full advantage of this scratch pad because now this scratch pad, this uh, fast um, memory is under the software control. It's up to you how to use these. Next, a few slides uh, about uh, cache and how it's internally designed to uh, be able to store a copy of data uh, so that you can access them quickly. Um, what we see here uh, is a very simple illustration of a direct mapped cache. We'll see, you know, if it is not direct mapped, how we organize them. But for the direct map case, uh, what you see here is um, this is the SRAM based cache. You store information, uh, some data, and the data is actually in this block. And you can use um, you know, two to the power B bytes per block. Let's say if you uh, choose B equals to eight, so you're talking about two to the power eight. Uh, so that's 256 bytes 
in this block. Now this B is actually a part of the address that you use to access data. This address comes from the microprocessor and depends on uh, the processor, this address could be eight bit address, could be uh, 16 bit, could be 32 bit. Um, typically it's 32 bit address. And uh, we now here, let's say this little b, small b is eight. So we're talking about uh, eight bit out of the 32 bit, then this is the part of the address where we use to find the individual bytes in this block. Because in this block, we have exactly to the power of B bytes um, data here. Um, and then on the, um, uh, the next set of bits is called the set index. Set index is uh, the, the bits we use to find out which set we're gonna be looking for the, the bytes, looking for the data blocks. Um, so it depends on how many bits we use here. Let's say if we have uh, another eight bits. So we have eight bits here for the block offset, and then we have another eight bits for the set index. The set index, because it's eight bit, so we're really talking about we have from set zero, one, up to set 255. So all together 256 sets. Um, so with this eight bits here, we can find out which set uh, that we're gonna be going into to look for that block. Okay, so now you may wonder, then you have you know, another maybe, you know, in our case 16 bits left because let's say we have 32 bit address, we have eight bits here, eight bits here, then the tag, this part will be 16 bits. How are we gonna use this 16 bits? Now, if we have a data uh, in, uh, let's say uh, this set number one, okay, let's say this eight bit, we have zero, 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 0001, so that's gonna be set index one. So that will you know, guide us to this set. Do we know if the, you know, um, the data we're looking for is here or not? Um, it might be there, but it might be not. The only way we can tell is to compare the tag that's stored as a part of the data block with the tag with the remaining upper 16 bits from the address. If this tag matches this tag, then we say we have a cache hit. Um, that really means that the data block we're trying to access using this address is here. Okay. Um, so it's the, let's say if you access a byte and you, you give this address. So, and if this tag matches, then we're gonna be using the lower eight bits um, from this block offset to find the um, um, byte that's in the block. So if you have uh, the lower eight bits as, let's say zero, 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 one, zero, so that's a two, so then that byte is here. Uh, if we say this is byte zero, byte one, byte two, so that byte is gonna be here. Now, if when we compare the tag um, here and here, they do not match, or if we see this valid, this flag is set as zero, which indicates it's invalid. So that's that means the the data block we're trying to access is not the, the ones that's already stored here. And that's called a cache miss. When we have a cache miss, uh, we will invalidate this block. So we're gonna be uh, kind of discard whatever is here. 
and then go to the lower uh, level of memory hierarchy, that means the DRAM, to load the real block, real bytes here, to fill this up, and then put a tag here, and mark this as a valid. So why do we do that? Because the next time, if you access the same address, you will sure find this tag will match with your address's tag, and it's a valid block, so your data will be here. And that's really the benefit of having a cache um, so that we will be able to store the, the frequently used data in this fast uh, SRAM and to save the time from you know, you know, accessing the, the DRAM again and again. Do you have any questions if I move on to the next? All right, so in the first case, we were talking about a direct mapped. And here is the, um, it's a little bit different in the sense that in each set, we may have more than one um, blocks. So in this case, we have um, you know, one, two, or well, maybe more in set zero. And then we have another set of blocks in a different set one and so on. So um, this will give us um, some additional requirement because when you use this uh, set index to find the set, you will need to compare a tag with a few of those here in the same set. And for sure there will be one matches if there's a match. Uh, because all these tags should be different. And if there's a match, uh, you declare that's a cache hit, and then this block here is the, um, the data that you want to access. Um, if there's no match, okay, none of these uh, tags stored here matches what you have in the incoming address, then guess what? You need to replace one of those uh, with the, this tag and by uh, replacing really mean that we have to go to the DRAM to fetch the corresponding block, put the real data here, update this tag with the, um, the address you are using, and then mark this as a valid. Okay, um, so the tag matching is part of the process for the set associative cache, and it's done usually using associative memory or content addressable memory so the matching can be done quickly. Um, we mentioned earlier that if there's a cache miss, you need to replace one of these existing blocks in a set. Uh, you can use policies like uh, least recently used or first in first out to replace one of those um, existing blocks in the set. Okay, so that was a, a very quick introduction about the cache architecture. Uh, you probably uh, learned a bit of bit about cache in your computer architecture course if you're taking one or already took one. So overall, what we covered so far was the memory architecture, uh, how we use software to access data, uh, also how do we manage the memory uh, in high-level programs, um, and you know, internally how these memory hierarchies are implemented. Um, so far, all the programs that we, you know, we've seen uh, or we've written, um, you don't really talk about timing. Uh, timing is not part of the software semantics. Uh, when you write a software, what you really care about is the correct execution of the program. Uh, no matter what languages you use, uh, you really, your program has nothing to do with how long it takes to do anything. Um, of course, there are exceptions when you use, um, you know, time really functions specifically, but most of the time you care about the correctness of the program. Um, so 
all the computation and networking abstractions uh, are based on this premises. And when you execute a program, um, if the program takes advantage of the cache hierarchy, um, you, you, you can benefit from it um, if your data is already in a cache. But on the other hand, uh, you really don't know uh, how quickly or how slowly your program are gonna finish. Uh, particularly if you have a lot of memory access instructions, um, you will have you know, very hard time to um, predict or calculate exactly uh, how long your program is going to take because the memory accesses um, may take sh shorter time if the data is already in the cache. Um, but if the data is not in the cache, then longer ac memory access latency is expected. So that's why we say uh, caches improve the performance uh, at the expense of making it difficult to control timing. So that's kind of the, the downside of it. And in, in some situations, uh, you may um, need to know exactly or control exactly how quickly your instructions or program finish. In that case, you have to uh, be mindful about the underlying cache architecture that may uh, influence the execution time. Um, so we talk about memory architecture, uh, which is uh, essential to programming embedded systems. 